Hello, my name is Tom Clendon and I am an expert ACCA SBR online lecturer. And today's podcast is all about ISA 37. And the aspect of ISA 37 that I want to have a look at is the main aspect, which is accounting for revisions. And I want to have a look at the criteria and a couple of examples. Now, a provision in this context is a liability of uncertain timing or amount. So I'm not talking about provision for bad debts or provision for depreciation, but a liability, an obligation. And a simple example of a provision is corporation tax. Because we know when we're going to have to pay it, but we may not know exactly how much. A uh, provision is a liability of uncertain timing or amount. And under the standard, ISA 37, there are three criteria which all have to be met at the reporting date in order for us to recognise a provision. And the first of these three is that there has to be a present obligation that is either legal or constructive and has arisen from a past event. Secondly, there has to be a probability that we're going to pay it, a probable outflow of economic benefits. And thirdly, if we're going to make a debit and credit, we have to know how much. So it has to be capable of reliable measurement. Now, you've probably heard those three conditions before. What I want you to reflect on, though, is that each of them is fraught with judgment. A constructive obligation only arises if there's a, a valid expectation, if we've made a serious promise. And that's a judgment as to whether or not we've done enough or whether or not the, 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 the market, the, the, the shareholders, the users think we are going to do it. Have we? Is there a constructive obligation? That is always a debatable point. Probable. It's only a liability to be recognised if there is a probable transfer. Now, that means, I think, well, I know, more than 50%, more likely than not. So there's a judgment as to whether something is probable or possible. And in reality, there may be a judgment over whether or not we can quantify we can reliably estimate what the cost of doing something is or, or what the fine that we're going to be paid with. It might be a unique circumstance. In an exam situation, if you're given a number, it's probably going to be reliable. Um, but in reality, there is an issue around reliability, measuring that uh, liability. Incidentally, these three criteria, as laid out in ISA 37, are actually inconsistent with the new revised framework. Because the new revised framework says that we recognise liabilities when it's relevant and faithful to do so. So there's a little bit of a conceptual conflict there between the standard, three conditions, you recognise it on the three conditions, and the framework, which suggests that you recognise it when it's relevant and faithful to do so. But of course, we need to follow standards rather than the conceptual framework in practice and in the exam. But it does point to the idea that at some stage in the future, I say 37 could well be revised and there be different recognition criteria. Let's have a look at a couple of examples so that you understand the practicalities of how this might be tested. Let's think about a breach of contract. So we've done something wrong. We've broken our contract and we're being sued for damages. So there's clearly a past event. This is a legal situation. And I'm going to put a quantification of 10 million. So there is a reliable measure of 10 million. And so the issue about whether or not we make a provision hinges around whether or not it is probable 
we're going to lose the case. Probable, we're going to pay out the 10 million. Now, let me give you two scenarios. Scenario A, the lawyer says, there's a 60% chance we're going to lose and pay the money out. And in the second scenario, the lawyer says there's only a 40% chance we'll pay the money out. Now, if it's scenario A, 60% is probable. So you recognize the liability in full, 10 million. Debit P&L, credit revision, credit liability make a provision. If we look at scenario two, there's only a 40% chance of paying it out. That's possible. It doesn't meet the recognition threshold. And on that basis, no liability whatsoever is recognized. Instead, we call this a contingent liability. So instead of doing a debit and a credit, we write a little story in the notes to the accounts. We make a disclosure because we can't recognize it as a liability under ISA 37 because it is not probable. Now, this I would like you to reflect on means that ISA 37 takes an all or nothing approach. ISA 37 says you either have a liability or you don't. You recognize the 10 or you recognize nothing. I suppose it's a bit like being pregnant. You either are or you're not. But I would like you to further consider the situation of a parent company coming in to buy the subsidiary, coming in to buy this business in scenario B, where there is a no liability recognized, but a disclosure in the notes because there's a 40% chance of having to pay out 10 million. The acquirer under IFRS 3 will look to do a fair value exercise on the assets and liabilities. And so the acquirer will take a fair value approach. And on that basis, Although the subsidiary at the individual company stage won't have recognized a liability at all, as a consolidation adjustment, that contingent liability of a 40% chance of having to pay out 10 million can be reliably measured at 4 million. So as a fair value adjustment, the 4 million would be included in the group accounts it would reduce the net assets at the date of acquisition and as a result have a impact of meaning there's more goodwill. So that's a bit mind blowing, isn't it? Yeah, the same situation being accounted for in two different ways, depending upon whether you're applying ISA 37 at the individual company stage or whether you're looking at fair value adjustments, acquisition group account stage. That's one example. Now, my second example that I want to talk about in terms of ISA 37 is a piece of machinery. Call it an oil rig. Call it a wind farm. Call it something. And it's costing you 10 million pounds, 10 million dollars to install. So that's your capital expenditure. And maybe there's 1 million that you have to spend to install it you would capitalize that cost. But there's also a cost of 1 million that will not be incurred for 10 years until the end of the asset's life. There's a cost of another million to dismantle it. So you've got the original cost of 10 million, you've got the installation cost of one, and you've got the decommissioning, you've got the dismantling cost of one, a further one which will be incurred in 10 years time and the accounting issue is whether or not you provide for the dismantling costs the decommissioning costs and the answer to that question is it depends clearly there's been a past event which is the initial 
putting up of the oil rig, putting up of the wind farm, putting up of the machine. But do you have a legal obligation to take it down? The answer may be yes. There may be a contractual, simple legal obligation that the government says you've got to remove it, you've got to decommission it. Or there may be a constructive obligation because the company is green, because the company has published environmental policies where it's boasted, it's promised, it's raised valid expectations that it's going to take down the machine and restore the environment. Now, in that situation, there's a constructive obligation, there's a valid expectation, so a provision is made. And a provision is made in full at the beginning. Because as soon as you've put the machine up, you're obliged to take it down, either legally or through your promises. But because you're not going to take it down for 10 years, you would measure that provision at the present value. Because you're not going to take it down for 10 years, you would provide for the dismantling costs at its present value. You would discount it to a smaller sum. And you would capitalise that cost. So the cost of the oil rig, the cost of the wind farm, would be somewhere between 11 and 12. Yeah, because having discounted the dismantling cost, it would be a slightly smaller number than the one. And then subsequently, of course, having debited the asset and credited the liability, credited the provision, that provision, because it's been discounted, would be subject to an unwinding, would be subject to an annual finance charge, as you normally do when you've got liabilities which have been discounted. Well, there's more to ISA 37 than I've talked about, but I try and keep these podcasts short and sweet. Ten minutes is my budget. I've slightly overrun here. If you're interested um, in, in, in more of these podcasts, there's, there's lots of them on the series. Um, I also contact me through LinkedIn. And if you're interested in doing SBR, if you're serious about passing SBR, I do some online courses and mock exams, and I can help you pass. All you have to do is get in touch. My name is Tom Clendon. Thank you very much for listening.